Whether we listen with aloof amusement to the dreamlike mumbo-jumbo of some red-eyed witch doctor of the Congo, or read with cultivated rapture thin translations from the sonnets of the mystic Lao Tse, crack the hard nutshell of an argument of Aquinas, or catch suddenly the shining meaning of a bizarre Eskimo fairy tale, it will be always the one shape-shifting yet marvelously constant story that we find, together with a persistent suggestion of more to be experienced than will ever be known or told. Throughout the inhabited world, in all times and under every circumstance, the myths of man have flourished, and they have been the living inspiration of whatever else may have appeared out of the activities of the human body and mind. It would not be too much to say that myth is the secret opening through which the inexhaustible energies of the cosmos pour into human cultural manifestation. Religions, philosophies, arts, the social forms of primitive and historic man, prime discoveries in science and technology, the very dreams that blister sleep boil up from the magic ring of myth. The wonder is that the characteristic ability to touch and inspire deep creative centers dwells in the smallest nursery fairy tale, as the flavor of the ocean is contained in a droplet, or the whole mystery of life within the egg of a flea. For the symbols of mythology are not manufactured. They cannot be ordered, invented, or permanently suppressed. They are spontaneous productions of the psyche, and each bears within it, undamaged, the germ power of its source. What is the secret of the timeless vision? From what profundity of mind does it derive? Why is mythology everywhere the same beneath its varieties of costume? And what does it teach? Today, many sciences are contributing to the analysis of the riddle. Archaeologists are probing the ruins of Iraq, Honan, Crete, and Yucatan. Ethnologists are questioning the Ostiacs of the River Ob, the boobies of Fernando Po. A generation of Orientalists has thrown open to us the sacred writings of the East, as well as the pre-Hebrew sources of our own holy writ. Another host of scholars in the field of folk psychology has been seeking to establish the psychological bases of language, myth, religion, art development, and moral codes. Most remarkable of all, however, are the revelations that have emerged from the mental clinic. The writings of the psychoanalysts are indispensable to the student of mythology. Freud, Jung, and their followers have demonstrated irrefutably that the logic, the heroes, and the deeds of myth survive into modern times. In the absence of an effective general mythology, each of us has his private yet secretly potent pantheon of dream. The latest incarnation of Oedipus, the continued romance of Beauty and the Beast, stand this afternoon on the corner of 42nd Street and 5th Avenue, waiting for the traffic light to change. The unconscious sends all sorts of vapors, odd beings, terrors, and deluding images up into the mind, whether in dream, broad daylight, or insanity. For the human kingdom, beneath the floor of the comparatively neat little dwelling that we call our consciousness, goes down into unsuspected Aladdin caves. There abide not only jewels, but dangerous genies, the inconvenient or resisted psychological powers that we have not thought or dared to integrate into our lives. They may remain unsuspected, or, on the other hand, some chance word, the smell of a landscape, the taste of a cup of tea, or the glance of an eye may touch a magic spring, and then dangerous messengers begin to appear in the brain. Dangerous because they threaten the fabric of the security into which we have built ourselves and our families. But they are fiendishly fascinating, too, for they carry keys that open the whole realm of the desired and feared adventure of the discovery of the self destruction of the world in which we live and of ourselves within it, then a wonderful reconstruction of the bolder, cleaner, more spacious, more fully human life. That is the lure, the promise and terror of these disturbing night visitors from the mythological realm that we carry within. Psychoanalysis, the modern science of reading dreams, has taught us to take heed of these unsubstantial images. Also, it has found a way to let them do their work, the dangerous crises of self-development are permitted to come to pass under the protecting eye of an experienced initiate in the lore and language of dreams, who then enacts the role and character of the ancient mystagogue, or guide of souls, the initiating medicine man of the primitive forest sanctuaries of trial and initiation. The doctor, then, is the modern master of the mythological realm, the knower of all the secret ways and words of potency. His role is precisely that of the wise old man of the myths and fairy tales whose words assist the hero through the trials and errors of the weird adventure. 
He is the one who appears and points to the magic shining sword that will kill the dragon terror, tells of the waiting bride and the castle of many treasures, applies healing balm to the almost fatal wounds, and finally dismisses the conqueror back into the world of normal life. It has always been the prime function of mythology and rite to supply the symbols that carry the human spirit forward in counteraction to those constant human fantasies that tend to tie it back. In fact, it may well be that the very high incidence of neurosis today follows from the decline of such effective spiritual aid. We remain fixated to the unexercised images of our infancy, and hence disinclined to the necessary passages of our adulthood. In the United States, the goal is not to grow old, but to remain young, not to mature away from mother, but to cleave to her. And so, while husbands are worshipping at their boyhood shrines, being the lawyers, merchants, or masterminds their parents wanted them to be, their wives, even after fourteen years of marriage and two fine children, are still on the search for love, which comes to them under the makeup of the latest heroes of the screen. The psychoanalyst has to assert again the tried wisdom of the older, forward-looking teachers of the masked medicine dancers and the witch doctor circumcisers, whereupon we find that the ageless initiation symbolism is produced spontaneously by the patient himself at the moment of the release. Apparently there is something in these initiatory images so necessary to the psyche that if they are not supplied from without, through myth and ritual, they will have to be announced again through dream from within. Each one brings the myth right out of himself, and what the analyst does is help you recognize it as the uh, image carrier of your own affects, your own energies. The value of the psychiatrist is that he helps you to relate your own images to your own affects, to your own uh, energy system. And the reason you're in trouble is that you don't realize this. Now, in the traditional societies, the images were supplied. Uh, the uh, traditional mythology supplies the images, and you're supposed to have the affect. Uh, we're reversing that. Uh, the artist has an experience, and he seeks the images through which to communicate it or render it. And he doesn't say to somebody, you have to get this message. Well, some of them do, but those are the ones we don't like to talk about. The, uh, he, he exhibits his work, and if you like it, fine. If you don't... And so there's a, a sort of community of people who have uh, slightly similar myths. Uh, but then we'll allow other people to have their own myths, each to have his own freedom. Uh, this is exactly the point, that it's an individual quest. No one ever had your dreams. You're in the dark forest every time you go to sleep. Uh, the only thing is that most of us leave our miracle down there and don't bring it up again. Sigmund Freud stresses in his writings the passages and difficulties of the first half of the human cycle of life, those of our infancy and adolescence, when our sun is mounting toward its zenith. Carl Jung, on the other hand, has emphasized the crises of the second portion, when, in order to advance, the shining sphere must submit to descend and disappear, at last, into the night womb of the grave. The normal symbols of our desires and fears become converted into their opposites, for it is then no longer life, but death, that is the challenge. What is difficult to leave then is not the womb, but the phallus. Full circle from the tomb to the womb, to the womb to the tomb we come. An ambiguous, enigmatical incursion into the world of solid matter that is soon to melt from us like the substance of a dream. And looking back at what had promised to be our own unique, unpredictable and dangerous adventure, all we find in the end is such a series of standard metamorphoses as men and women have undergone in every quarter of the world, in all recorded centuries, and under every odd disguise of civilization. The story is told, for example, of the great Minos, king of the island empire of Crete in the period of its commercial supremacy, how he hired the celebrated artist craftsman Daedalus to invent and construct for him a labyrinth, in which to hide something of which the palace was at once ashamed and afraid. For there was a monster on the premises which had been born to Pasiphae, the queen. Minos the king had been busy, it is said, with important wars to protect the trade routes. And meanwhile, Pasiphae had been seduced by a magnificent snow-white sea-born bull. It had been nothing worse, really, than what Minos' own mother had allowed to happen. Minos' mother was Europa, and it is well known that she was carried by a bull to Crete. The bull had been the god Zeus, and the honored son of that sacred union was Minos himself, now everywhere respected and gladly served. How then could Pasiphae have known that the fruit of her own indiscretion would be a monster, this little son with human body but the head and tail of a bull? Society has blamed the queen greatly, but the king was not unconscious of his own share of guilt. 
The bull in question had been sent by the god Poseidon long ago, when Minos was contending with his brothers for the throne. Minos had asserted that the throne was his by divine right, and had prayed the god to send a bull out of the sea as a sign. And he had sealed the prayer with a vow to sacrifice the animal immediately, as an offering and symbol of service. The bull had appeared, and Minos took the throne. But when he beheld the majesty of the beast that had been sent, and thought what an advantage it would be to possess such a specimen, he determined to risk a merchant's substitution, of which he supposed the god would take no great account. Offering on Poseidon's altar the finest white bull that he owned, he added the bull from the sea to his herd. The Cretan Empire had greatly prospered under the sensible jurisdiction of this celebrated lawgiver and model of public virtue. Knossos, the capital city, became the luxurious, elegant center of the leading commercial power of the civilized world. The Cretan fleets went out to every isle and harbor in the Mediterranean. Cretan ware was prized in Babylonia and Egypt. The bold little ships even broke through the gates of Hercules to the open ocean, coasting then northward to take the gold of Ireland and the tin of Cornwall, as well as southward around the bulge of Senegal to remote Yoruba land and the distant marts of ivory, gold, and slaves. But at home, the queen had been inspired by Poseidon with an ungovernable passion for the bull, and she had prevailed upon her husband's artist craftsman, the peerless Daedalus, to frame for her a wooden cow that would deceive the bull, into which she eagerly entered, and the bull was deceived. She bore her monster, which, in due time, began to become a danger. And so Daedalus again was summoned, this time by the king, to construct a tremendous labyrinthine enclosure with blind passages in which to hide the thing away. So deceptive was the invention that Daedalus himself, when he had finished it, was scarcely able to find his way back to the entrance. There in the Minotaur, half man, half bull, was settled, and he was fed thereafter on groups of living youths and maidens carried as tribute from the conquered nations within the Cretan domain. Thus, according to the ancient legend, the primary fault was not the queen's but the king's, and he could not really blame her, for he knew what he had done. He had converted a public event to personal gain, whereas the whole sense of his investiture as king had been that he was no longer a mere private person. The return of the bull should have symbolized his absolutely selfless submission to the functions of his role. The retaining of it represented, on the other hand, an impulse to egocentric self-aggrandizement, and so the king, by the grace of God, became the dangerous tyrant Holdfast, out for himself. Just as the traditional rites of passage used to teach the individual to die to the past and be reborn to the future, so the great ceremonials of investiture divested him of his private character and clothed him in the mantle of his vocation. Such was the ideal, whether the man was a craftsman or a king. By the sacrilege of the refusal of the right, however, the individual cut himself as a unit off from the larger unit of the whole community. And so the one was broken into the many, and these then battled each other, each out for himself, and could be governed only by force. The figure of the tyrant monster is known to the mythologies, folk traditions, legends, and even nightmares of the world, and his characteristics are everywhere essentially the same. He is the hoarder of the general benefit. He is the monster avid for the greedy rights of my and mine. The havoc wrought by him is described in mythology and fairy tales as being universal throughout his domain. This may be no more than his household, his own tortured psyche, or the lives that he blights with the touch of his friendship and assistance or it may amount to the extent of his civilization. The inflated ego of the tyrant is a curse to himself and to his world, no matter how his affairs may seem to prosper. Self-terrorized, fear-haunted, the giant of self-achieved independence is the world's messenger of disaster, even though, in his mind, he may entertain himself with humane intentions. Wherever he sets his hand, there is a cry, if not from the rooftops, then, more miserably, within every heart, a cry for the redeeming hero, the carrier of the shining blade, whose blow, whose touch, whose existence will liberate the land. As T.S. Eliot tells us in The Wasteland, here one can neither stand nor lie nor sit, there is not even silence in the mountains, but dry, sterile thunder without rain. There is not even solitude in the mountains, but red, sullen faces sneer and snarl from doors of mud-cracked houses. The hero is the man of self-achieved submission. But submission to what? That precisely is the riddle that today we have to ask ourselves, for it is everywhere the primary virtue and historic deed of the hero to resolve. 
As Professor Arnold J. Toynbee indicates in his study of the laws of the rise and disintegration of civilizations, schism in the soul, schism in the body social, will not be resolved by any scheme of return to the good old days or by programs guaranteed to render an ideal projected future. Only birth can conquer death. The birth not of the old thing again, but of something new. Peace, then, is a snare. War is a snare. Change is a snare. Permanence a snare. When our days come for the victory of death, death closes in. There is nothing we can do except be crucified and resurrected, dismembered totally, and then reborn. Theseus, the hero slayer of the Minotaur, entered Crete from without as the symbol and arm of the rising civilization of the Greeks. That was the new and living thing. But it is also possible for the principle of regeneration to be sought and found within the very walls of the tyrant's empire itself. Professor Toynbee uses the terms detachment and transfiguration to describe the crisis by which the higher spiritual dimension is attained that makes possible the resumption of the work of creation. The first step, detachment or withdrawal, consists in a radical transfer of emphasis from the external to the internal world, a retreat from the desperations of the wasteland to the peace of the everlasting realm that is within. But this realm, as we know from psychoanalysis, is precisely the infantile unconscious. It is the realm that we enter in sleep. We carry it within ourselves forever. All the ogres and secret helpers of our nursery are there, all the magic of childhood, and more important, all the life potentialities that we never managed to bring to adult realization. Those other portions of our self are there. For such golden seeds do not die. If only a portion of that lost totality could be dredged up into the light of day, we should experience a marvelous expansion of our powers, a vivid renewal of life. We should tower in stature. Moreover, if we could dredge up something forgotten, not only by ourselves, but by our whole generation, or our entire civilization, we should become indeed the boon bringer, the culture hero of the day, a personage of not only local, but world historical moment. In a word, the first work of the hero is to retreat from the world to zones of the psyche where the difficulties really reside, and there to clarify the difficulties, eradicate them, and break through to the undistorted direct experience and assimilation of what Carl Jung has called the archetypal images. This is the process known to Hindu and Buddhist philosophy as viveka, discrimination. The archetypes to be discovered and assimilated are precisely those that have inspired throughout the annals of human culture the basic images of ritual, mythology, and vision. These eternal ones of the dream are not to be confused with the personally modified symbolic figures that appear in nightmare and madness to the still tormented individual. Dream is the personalized myth, myth the depersonalized dream. Both myth and dream are symbolic in the same general way of the dynamics of the psyche. But in the dream the forms are quirked by the peculiar troubles of the dreamer, whereas in myth the problems and solutions shown are directly valid for all mankind. Jung's concept is that the dream, the unconscious, complements the conscious situation. And where the conscious situation is radically wrong, the dream offers a correction. So that the first thing the doctor has to do is find what the person's situation is to which the dream is talking, and then ask the person to associate with the object in pure consciousness, not free association. But what, what do you think of in relation to this image? When, however, a truly mythological image appears in the dream with which the person can have no personal associations, then you've hit another level of the unconscious, what he calls the collective unconscious. And that part of the dream can be interpreted tentatively, you know, or approximately by comparative mythological studies, what he calls the amplification of the dream imagery by comparative studies. His notion is not that the dream is trying to hide something from you, as in the Freudian view, but the dream is trying to reveal something to you through a language, through a picture language that you don't know how to read. Well then, how do you read the language? Well, how would you break any cryptic script? The philological method of comparison. 
You know, when you receive a letter uh, in a handwriting that you can't quite read and there's a word you can't decipher, you go back to see if there are any other letters that look like this one. Oh, yes, that's a T. Oh, that's the way she's making her O's now. And all that kind of thing, you put the word together. And so it is with the images in dream. If they are from the personal recollections, from the personal unconscious, the individual dreaming will have associations, and by amplifying these, you can interpret the dream. But if it hits the collective level, the only way to interpret it is by mythological comparisons, because there what is talking is the biological inheritance. The unconscious is not only a uh, reservoir of rejected personal experiences, it is also uh, a source from the inherited impulses of the body. Every organ of the body has its impulse, and they're all pushing from within, and in that sense you share your mythology with everyone else. These are the art of time. I'm told there was a beautiful park here once, about 300 years ago, and they say you used to live nearby. Things must have been much better in those days. That's the case, isn't it, Remy Masuda? Yes, you're right. Just over there was the most beautiful rose garden. On summer evenings, I used to sit on my terrace sipping tea and enjoying the fragrance of the flowers. You like roses, don't you? When I looked in your cryogenic capsule, all I discovered were some rose petals. It was probably my parents who would have put them in the capsule for me. I was dying from a rare form of hereditary anemia. It was decided that before the disease went too far, I should be put into cryogenic suspension in the hope that a cure would be found in the future. While I was asleep, I dreamt of this place, of the roses, and of my parents and the way things used to be. Then I awoke, and all my dreaming has stopped. My new life is a living nightmare. Try not to worry. Your nightmare will be over soon. The hero is the man or woman who has been able to battle past his or her personal and local historical limitations to the generally valid, normally human forms. Such a one's visions, ideas, and inspirations come pristine from the primary springs of human life and thought. The hero has died as a modern man, but as eternal man, perfected, unspecific, universal man, he has been reborn. His second solemn task and deed, therefore, is to return then to us transfigured and teach the lesson he has learned of life renewed. What follows is taken from Frederick Pierce's book, Dreams of Personality. I was walking alone around the upper end of a large city through slummy, muddy streets lined with hard little houses. I did not know where I was, but liked the exploring. I chose one street which was terribly muddy and led across what must have been an open sewer. I followed along between rows of shanties and then discovered a little river flowing between me and some high firm ground where there was a paved street. This was a nice perfectly clear river flowing over grass. I could see the grass moving under the water. There was no way to cross, so I went to a little house and asked for a boat. A man there said, of course, he could help me across. He brought out a small wooden box which he put on the edge of the river and I saw at once that with this box I could easily jump across. I knew all danger was over, and I wanted to reward the man richly. In thinking of this dream, I have a distinct feeling that I did not have to go where I was at all, but could have chosen a comfortable walk along paved streets. I had gone to the squalid and muddy district because I preferred adventure, and having begun, I had to go on. When I think of how persistently I kept going straight ahead in the dream, it seems as though I must have known that there was something fine ahead, like that lovely grassy river and the secure, high, paved road beyond. Thinking of it in those terms, it is like a determination to be born, or rather to be born again, in a spiritual sense. It is remarkable that in this dream, the basic outline of the universal adventure of the hero is reproduced to the detail. The crossing first of the open sewer, then of the perfectly clear river flowing over grass, the appearance of the willing helper at the critical moment, and the high, firm ground beyond the final stream. 
These are the everlastingly recurrent themes of the wonderful song of the soul's high adventure. The dreamer is assisted across the water by the gift of a small wooden box which takes the place in this dream of the more usual skiff or bridge. This is a symbol of her own special talent and virtue by which she has been ferried across the waters of the world. We do not know what special contents the box would have revealed, but it is certainly a variety of Pandora's box, that divine gift of the gods to a beautiful woman, filled with the seeds of all the troubles and blessings of existence, but also provided with the sustaining virtue, hope. By this, the dreamer crosses to the other shore, and by a like miracle, so will each whose work is the difficult, dangerous task of self-discovery and self-development be ported across the ocean of life. It is only those who know neither an inner call nor an outer doctrine whose plight truly is desperate, that is to say, most of us today, in this labyrinth, without and within the heart. Alas, where is the guide, that fond virgin Ariadne, to supply the simple clue that will give us courage to face the Minotaur and the means then to find our way to freedom when the monster has been met and slain. Ariadne, the daughter of King Minos, fell in love with the handsome Theseus the moment she saw him disembark from the boat that had brought the pitiful group of Athenian youths and maidens for the Minotaur. She found a way to talk to him and declared that she would supply a means to help him back out of the labyrinth if he would promise to take her away from Crete with him and make her his wife. The pledge was given. Ariadne turned for help then to the crafty Daedalus by whose art the labyrinth had been constructed. Daedalus simply presented her with a skein of linen thread which the visiting hero might fix to the entrance and unwind as he went into the maze. It is indeed very little that we need, but lacking that, the adventure into the labyrinth is without hope. That little is close at hand. Most curiously, the very scientist who in the service of the sinful king was the brain behind the horror of the labyrinth quite as readily conserve the purposes of freedom. But the hero heart must also be at hand. For centuries, Daedalus has represented the type of the artist-scientist, that curiously disinterested, almost diabolic human phenomenon beyond the normal bounds of social judgment, dedicated to the morals not of his time, but of his art. He is the hero of the way of thought, single-hearted, courageous, and full of faith that the truth as he finds it shall make us free. And so now we may turn to him as did Ariadne, the flax for the linen of his thread he has gathered from the fields of the human imagination. Centuries of husbandry, decades of diligent culling, the work of numerous hearts and hands have gone into the hackling, sorting, and spinning of this tightly twisted yarn. Furthermore, we do not even have to risk the adventure alone, for the heroes of all time have gone before us. The labyrinth is thoroughly known. We have only to follow the thread of the hero path. And where we had thought to find an abomination, we shall find a god. Where we had thought to slay another, we shall slay ourselves. Where we had thought to travel outward, we shall come to the center of our own existence. Where we had... They illustrate the fact that the devotee at the moment of entry into a temple undergoes a metamorphosis. His secular character remains without. He sheds it as a snake sheds its skin. Once inside, he may be said to have died to time and returned to the world womb, the world navel, the earthly paradise. The mere fact that anyone can physically walk past the temple guardians does not invalidate their significance, for if the intruder is incapable of encompassing the sanctuary, then he has effectually remained without. Anyone unable to understand a god sees it as a devil and is thus defended from the approach. Allegorically, then, the passage into a temple and the hero dive through the jaws of the whale are identical ventures, both denoting in picture language the life-centering, life-renewing act. Ananda Kumra Swami writes, No creature can attain a higher grade of nature without ceasing to exist. Indeed, the physical body of the hero may be actually slain, dismembered, and scattered over the land or sea, as in the Egyptian myth of the savior Osiris. He was thrown into a sarcophagus and committed to the Nile by his brother Set, and when he returned from the dead, his brother slew him again, tore the body into fourteen pieces, and scattered those over the land. The twin heroes of the Navajo had to pass not only the clashing rocks, but also the reeds that cut the traveler to pieces, the cane cactuses that tear him to pieces, and the boiling sands that overwhelm him. 
The hero whose attachment to ego is already annihilated passes back and forth across the horizons of the world, in and out of the dragon, as readily as a king through all the rooms of his house. And therein lies his power to save, for his passing and returning demonstrate that through all the contraries of phenomenality, the uncreate, imperishable remains, and there is nothing to fear. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. With these fateful words, Count Leo Tolstoy opened the novel of the spiritual dismemberment of his modern heroine, Anna Karenina, that distracted wife, mother, and blindly impassioned mistress threw herself beneath the wheels of the train, thus terminating with a gesture symbolic of what had already happened to her soul, her tragedy of disorientation. Modern romance, like Greek tragedy, celebrates the mystery of dismemberment, which is life in time. The happy ending is justly scorned as a misrepresentation, for the world as we know it, as we have seen it, yields but one ending, death, disintegration, dismemberment, and the crucifixion of our heart with the passing of the forms that we have loved. The happy ending of a fairy tale, a myth, and the divine comedy of the soul is to be read not as a contradiction, but as a transcendence of the universal tragedy of man. The objective world remains what it was, but because of a shift of emphasis within the subject, is beheld as though transformed. Where formerly life and death contended, now enduring being is made manifest, as indifferent to the accidents of time as water boiling in a pot is to the destiny of a bubble, or as the cosmos to the appearance and disappearance of a galaxy of stars. Tragedy is the shattering of the forms and of our attachment to the forms. I'm going to dream of you. It's incredible that the light from those stars has taken millions of years to get here. How many lifetimes must it have taken for the light to reach the Earth? More than we can imagine, but the Earth is only the start of its great journey, an insignificant speck in the cosmos. I will travel with the light forever, dreaming of you. No, nothing lasts forever. Everything comes to the end of its journey one day. Even the light. <laughs> <laughs>